Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Teresa Vizi. I'm the interim director of the Ulrich Museum of Art here at Wichita State, and I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's presenter, uh, the man you've all come to see, the beloved faculty artist here at Wichita State, the very talented Ron Christ. We are very excited to have his exhibition, Ronald Christ Poetic Fictions, kick off not only the Ulrich Museum's fall exhibition schedule, but also to help us celebrate the grand reopening of the Ulrich Museum after a nine-month renovation. Uh, as you were entering the theater, I'm sure you noticed the sales table in the foyer. Ron has created digital catalogs of the exhibition, Poetic Fictions, which includes illustrated works of all 38 pieces in the show and features details of many of those works. It is available tonight for $10, and you may still purchase those after the artists talk this evening. If you didn't have a chance to view Ron's exhibition on view over at the Ulrich Museum prior to tonight's talk, have no fear. Poetic fictions will be on view at the Ulrich Museum through December 16. There are many people that I want to thank, people who helped make this exhibition possible. So first, let me thank all of the exhibition lenders. You all graciously parted with Ron's work for a period of several months so that the Ulrich Museum could assemble such a strong survey exhibition. And for that sacrifice, I really thank you. I also want to offer heartfelt thanks to our wonderful exhibition sponsors, uh, Emprise Bank, Fidelity Bank, Southwest National Bank, and I also want to um, recognize those generous individuals who helped make this exhibition a possibility. J. Eric Engstrom, Anita Jones, Mike and Dee Michaelis, and Reuben and Jane Saunders. So, on to the star of this evening's event, uh, Professor of Painting, Ron Christ. Ron received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in painting and printmaking from the Kansas City Art Institute and his Master of Fine Arts degree in painting from Indiana University in Bloomington. It was in 1976 when Ron joined the School of Art and Design uh, faculty here at Wichita State. He told me that one of the things that attracted him to campus was his new faculty office and studio space. Uh, McKnight West, which houses the School of Art and Design, uh, including studio art, was added in 1975, right before Ron arrived. And during his campus tour, he was shown the space of where his faculty office and studio would be. He was impressed with what he saw, the high walls, the skylights, and having such a wonderful workspace, including all that natural light that filled his office and studio, uh, really sealed the deal. So with the exception of when he travels abroad, Ron's studio space here at Wichita State is the only place that he paints. And speaking of traveling abroad, since 2000, Ron has accompanied Wichita State students, friends, and alumni to the International School of Painting, Drawing, and Sculpture in Umbria, Italy, which is in the heart of the country uh, between Florence and Rome. It is there that students participate in a painting program that emphasizes figure and landscape painting. So it's appropriate that a number of landscapes, Italian landscapes Ron painted while in Italy are included in the Ulrich exhibition. Ron truly is an artist of merit, having received the Kansas Governor's Artist Award in 1995 from then Kansas Governor Bill Graves. Wichita State's Excellence in Teaching Award in, 2000, uh, in 2010, and the Artist Award from the Wichita Arts Council in 2001. He has been in numerous exhibitions, more than 30 of which have been one-person shows, and his work is part of public collections, including Emprise Bank, Fidelity Bank, Hallmark Cards, and the Ulrich Museum. Before I welcome Ron to the stage, I want to share with all of you a conversation that he and I had uh, over the summer as we were preparing the Ulrich Museum's newsletter and invitation to go to print. Uh, Ron came over to the museum uh, with one of the proof copies and he pointed out in the, in the newsletter the museum's use of the word beloved to describe him in the text, how we refer to him as a beloved professor of art at Wichita State. And with a somewhat embarrassed look on his face, he asked me, is that really true, beloved? 
and I assured him that it was. But Ron, it's not just the staff of the Ulrich Museum who feel this way. Let me share with you the thoughts of some others who are of a like mind because they are your fans too. So from Wichita Art Museum director Patricia McDonald, former Ulrich Museum director and curator of, poet of poetic fictions, wrote, because I so admire Ron's work, I was eager to curate a show with him for the Ulrich. Working with him, my appreciation for the depth and intelligence of his work expanded greatly. We know him to be stunningly gifted with technique. His complexity of intellect is subtle and also impressive. From Wichita gallerist Ruben Saunders, owner of Artworks, who represents Ron Christ, uh, Ron was the first artist that Ruben ever represented when he opened his gallery doors in May of 1978. He had the pleasure of seeing Ron's work early on and has observed the artist's progression. Said Ruben, I was drawn to how precise the work was. The colors he used were so rich, the paintings were meticulous and perfectly balanced. From Dr. Walter Myers, Dean Emeritus of Wichita State's College of Fine Arts, he wrote, during my 38 years at WSU, I have known Ron Christ as a colleague and friend, as his chairman and dean, and as a distinguished visual artist, Ron, you inspire me. From Dr. Rodney Miller, current dean of Wichita State's College of Fine Arts, Ron Christ is as articulate and focused as a colleague, mentor, and teacher as he is as an artist. He is one of the most valued and valuable members of the Wichita State Fine Arts faculty, and his contribution to art can be measured not only by the aesthetic and artistic contributions in this body of work, but also by the number of students who have been enriched by their exposure to his wisdom and knowledge. The same can be said for our faculty who count themselves fortunate to have called Ron both a friend and a colleague. And finally, from a former student of Ron's, Joanna Mix Ramondetta, who received Bachelor of Arts degrees in painting and art history from Wichita State. She writes, I am very grateful to Ron for instilling in us a deep understanding and appreciation for drawing, especially in perspective. He taught us to observe and understand how objects move through space. I have consistently tried to apply his teachings of these elements to my own artistic works. Ron, you truly are a beloved professor of art here at Wichita State University, and we are so fortunate to have you here. Please help me welcome Ron Christ. Thank you, Teresa, and thank all of you for being here this evening. I have to say, though, during that conversation, when I questioned the use of the word beloved, eventually Teresa just said, it's our show, and we can say anything we want. <laughs> I said, okay. Well, uh, having the survey exhibition, um, even if it were located somewhere else, would be quite a big event when we're covering that many years of a career. But folks I've worked most closely with in the classroom and as colleagues, I, over the summer I began saying, it's like getting ready for the biggest, toughest crit of my life because it's here um, where I deliver crits in the classroom. And some of the toughest critics, probably the toughest critics in this city or the region are here. So, uh, that's balanced, of course, with the excitement and, and the thrill. I do want to recognize, certainly I want to thank, also thank all of those that uh, Teresa uh, mentioned in the introduction. But if Barbara, if you would raise your hand, my loving wife Barbara, really throughout the whole career has endured some of those long hours in the studio and pretty crazy times. And also Wilson Baldridge, professor of French. Wilson, would you? Wilson wrote the wonderful poem uh, that's on the entry wall at the exhibition and uh, in the catalog. So it, as a friend and colleague, it was a, an amazing gesture. And uh, so I just wanted to thank Wilson. OK, the title. How I got from there to there in 36 years and a lot in between. 
uh, format for this evening, folks. I'm watching the time. Um, I'm planning on this being very informal, very conversational. I'm just going to, well, what I said actually was, I'm just going to spill my guts. But very conversational. I'm just going to tell the truth. Uh, all of the work is arranged chronologically. When we get to the images of the work, uh, the 38 pieces that are in the uh, survey are big. Uh, there's another group that's not quite as big. There were three pieces that uh, initially were uh, granted, uh, lent for the exhibition, key pieces. Uh, but as shipping neared, the collectors changed their mind. So I'm not going to mention names, but uh, I do want to point those out because we, Patricia and I, really did want those three pieces in the exhibition. There's one or two more that are a little larger, simply because I have a little more to say about them that aren't in the exhibition. The smaller images are pieces not in the exhibition but are concurrent with uh, works that are. So I'm starting this uh, talk with, oh, sorry, starting the talk with uh, some of the work I did my last semester of graduate school. Um, another reason why I mentioned the biggest, toughest crit of my life is we too have a terminal degree MFA program. So we know that that first uh, IU's program at that time, it still is a two-year program instead of a three-year. So there wasn't much time to get it together and figure things out for thesis show. Um, but I wanted to show this uh, still life painting. It was the last one I did uh, before the thesis show. And uh, certainly you can see the similarity to the earliest work in, in the survey. I also wanted to show these little cut paper pieces uh, to emphasize that abstraction has been lurking in the background for a long time. Uh, and occasionally has come out in work that survived the fire or the mat knife. Um, and so some of these small cut paper pieces were included in the thesis show. It's how I used my leftover color aid paper from undergraduate school, color course. So here we have the two earliest uh, still lives that are in, uh, I did both of these that first fall semester. The one on the left is the very first painting I did when I got here. Uh, the exhibition also includes a painting I finished two weeks before the show opened. So we, we cover the spectrum. What I would say here is that knowing that those cut paper pieces as well as some graph paper drawings and uh, embossed gridded drawings were going on, that at th that time and still I think in my vocabulary uh, until the most recent work, this is about as abstract as a representational painting can get. Uh, the flat bands of color uh, are insistently two-dimensional. Uh, the illusion, uh, one of my graduate faculty, James McGarrell in a crit one time, said, we, we know how well illusions or fictions have been painted in the history of painting. And he summed it up by saying, illusions that don't work just don't work. So if I was going to paint illusions of space or volume, contrasting with the insistency of fact, of flatness, I had to try to make the illusions as strong as they could be. So in these works, uh, you know, two of, of what I think are the best of, of this batch of work are, are in the show. So here are some things that uh, were going on after. These are a little later as, as these uh, still lives developed and evolved. You see that they got more complex. Uh, they tended, the faceting tended to be emphasized more. So I think they became really more abstracted. Um, at this time, uh, these works are what I usually call completely formal. These are only paintings about painting things. They are purely aesthetic. So to read any kind of symbolism or metaphor into the, 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 vest, the, the bowl as a vessel or the bowl as a female form, no. That, that was not what these are about. Um, that will change quite quickly uh, in the evolution of the work. 
but at this time I thought of these. I often think of uh, Mozart's musical inventions as, as being, we know he wrote passions and we, we know that he wrote uh, great works of music that are more thematic or even narrative in the musical sense, but musical inventions are, are more formal pieces. And you see once again on the, the lower right, an example of, uh, I did a whole group of these layered graph paper and uh, pencil drawings. If you were here early enough to see the, what Ron Christ likes to look at, you saw two grids. So I'm very happy looking at a grid. So this is just, uh, you know, really a couple years later uh, in the painting on the uh, left is in the exhibition. You see what uh, began to happen here. The basic format is the same, uh, but I did begin inserting elements of nature, a little step at a time. So there's a, a lemon, that reference uh, to landscape, nature, something other than these geometric forms. Uh, some of the, the vessel forms that I started using uh, were, some were more open, some were more closed, I was beginning to think about saying things, referring to things in these paintings that were not purely formal. Uh, with my students, and they can verify this, uh, we as artists wear two hats. One is the artist part. The other is the art, the human part. Um, Art doesn't have to get involved with what one of my grad teachers called that messy thing called life. Um, so he too was discussing the possibility of work that is purely aesthetic, but we know art can definitely get involved with life things. So that was beginning to change, uh, and in my own process it meant inserting uh, references to landscape, uh, images that suggested anatomical aspects and closed and open forms. You'll see that the patterning started to happen in, in the still lives, uh, breaking those bands. Uh, if you were here earlier, you saw altar pieces and polyptics. So some of these late, especially maybe the one on, on the right, uh, take on almost that kind of altar piece quality. So big jump. Uh, so one of the things I definitely want to do tonight is what prompted the changes, what uh, you know, seemed traumatic really uh, and required a period of work uh, working through. So one of those was certainly this shift from the landscape or part from the uh, still lives to the landscapes because what I wanted to express and talk about in, in the work uh, moved into aspects that were dealt with more uh, emotional, psychological qualities, interpersonal relationships. Uh, I'm not a radical ecologist, but ecological issues. I share an interest with my colleague Robert Bupp in the use of land and urban planning aspects like that. So. Um, in a nutshell, I began telling folks that the still life table was not a big enough stage anymore for what I wanted to do. Um, however, the Kansas landscape, there's the joke of it's the easiest landscape to draw in the world. Take a sheet of paper, go about three-fourths of the way down, and draw a line. And that's it. <laughs> and it's pretty accurate. So you can see, uh, and it's something that struck me, uh, that flat terrain, especially west of Wichita. Uh, so it was very conducive to the banded space that I was using uh, in the uh, still lives. I drew, uh, because I knew there, there had to be a big technical shift in, in the paintings. Uh, the still lives, the two especially in the show, have almost an enamel smooth kind of surface. There is some scraping in them. I was using very juicy painting medium at the time. Um, but I knew that one of the qualities I wanted to capture in the landscape was complexity. 
the complexity of hundreds of thousands of blades of grass or thousands of leaves without getting picky uh, and rendering those things individually. So I started with drawing, uh, and this is one of the two early shows that Ruben uh, sponsored of my work. It was a, this, the, seven, the 82 show, was the show of drawings. So I drew for a little over a year. Uh, so these are a few other and a few larger of the drawings during that time. Uh, if you get the catalog or if you, if you see the exhibition, uh, I didn't include any details here, uh, but my nickname for this, I never know whether to say this or not, is noodling. Uh, all of these drawings are pure line drawings. There is no blended value. It's all pencil. Uh, pardon me, it's all line drawn with charcoal pencil or graphite in the later work. So uh, this, this kind of layering of, of thousands of marks with a, a pretty wild application. So I wanted the details of the draw, one of the drawings in the show in the catalog looks like a Jackson Pollock or looks like that Cy Twombly that was in the, what I like to look at. Uh, let me back up. Uh, here I have the, on the upper right the drawn version of a piece called Interface and then Divergent Union. So uh, some of the first paintings then uh, to translate the, the Kansas landscape, Kansas based, uh, none of these places are exactly like this, uh, but I did use photographic references as well as uh, this is actually on a property where Barbara and I lived for a couple years. It's all a housing development now, sadly, but um, out near Super Target. So this is how it translated into paint, and I know things are a little blurry and these are small, but uh, if you see the, the landscape paintings in the exhibition, you'll, you'll see how the, rather than the linear value of getting it at tone in an indirect way, uh, there's a lot of layering going on in here. Very different kind of paint surface than the still lives. Uh, again, at the things I like to look at, you know, the, during this time I was working on the drawings, I, I was strategizing about the paintings. But looking at the techniques of Monet, close-ups of Balthus paintings, uh, Jackson Pollock paintings, that helped supplement my own ideas for the paint. So here are two more that are in the show. This is, uh, on the left, is uh, the first Earth Ocean painting. Um, when I move, when I was moving here in my Chevelle station wagon with the U-Haul behind it, in 76, um, when I came to the top of that ridge south of Emporia and saw the Flint Hills for the first time, I'm honestly, I, it gives me goosebumps still. Um, I could not believe it. Uh, I had to pull over because I thought it was gonna crash. Uh, the way that space opened up and the combination of its vastness, but the ocean-like quality of it uh, just really struck me. And the fact that it is an ancient, not ocean, but shallow ocean. Uh, so I, hence the Earth Ocean uh, moniker that gets attached to some of the work. Piece on the left is in the show. Uh, these are a couple of the other uh, larger scale paintings done during that time. What started happening with some of these pieces is that, uh, Patricia, make sure you get the gallery guide, even if you don't go to the show. <laughs> get, get the gallery guide, because Patricia's essay, it's also in the catalog, uh, go, goes into things really quite well. Um, that some of the themes that, starting here, uh, began to run through my work, uh, have to deal with time and change um, simultaneity. So one of the things about the Flint Hills, as we all know, is because the space is so vast, a vast, a very big tabletop, uh, multiple things can be occurring at the same time. I was still working representationally, so what can I do with landscape imagery that can su su suggest time and change? So the piece on the upper right, for example, uh, sunny, sunny skies on the left, uh, storm moving in, 
uh, and then the transitional panel in the middle. Uh, the bottom piece, if you were here early enough to see the uh, images of the old Bush Stadium, go cards, anyway, having grown up there. Uh, and I still think it's horrible that they tore it down, but uh, combined with the Saarinen images, uh, that lower right painting is Bush Stadium and the influence that that cupola hanging over the cast in place concrete, first of all, it was a little creepy, but an amazing, I thought it was an amazing experience being in that stadium. And if the cards are losing, you can just look at the architecture. So, so the piece on the left uh, is, is in the exhibition. Again, uh, to fully appreciate these, you, you, I think you have to see the work. Uh, there's, uh, you just have to. Simultaneity on the lower left, you see a, a little pair of paintings that I did. They're now split. They weren't, they weren't necessarily meant to stay together. Uh, but based on photographs uh, taken out in Greenwood County in the Flint Hills one morning, early, obviously, uh, sun was coming up in the east, the moon was setting in the west. So another kind of reference to time and change. Um, also to me, dawn and dusk make us very aware of time because they're fleeting. You know, we have that period 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. or so that's like pretty constant. But things change in a hurry at dawn and dusk. Uh, big drawing, the, the one on the left is in the show. My nickname for the upper right drawing, and Barbara can verify it, was The Killer. <laughs> that drawing just about drove me nuts. Um, but once again, mainly the bottom, the bottom third or so of the drawing, to, to, to get all of that complexity of, of, of the bushes and shrubbery, but without getting picky. Uh, Red Rain uh, was done, it's based on a, some terrain in uh, Scotland. Uh, it, I applied for and received a university-sponsored grant to uh, go to the moors in England, which are very much like the Flint Hills, um, as well as Scotland. It was also a period of time when my, my father was, was going through a, problems. Um, and, um, I read it as a kind of, em one of the most emotional paintings I had ever done up to that point. Uh, Earth, Ocean 7, Maneuvers. Uh, this is a period of time, I think the best thing I can say is, uh, I call it the snowball effect. That when we have wet snow, and you wanna build a snow person, let's be politically correct here, uh, or just make snowballs, uh, but certainly building a snow person. In the wet snow, it accumulates really fast and it gets heavy really fast. It's snow, it's snowball time here. Uh, things were happening really quite quickly. Uh, so, you know, we have the appearance of the city. I do need to back up to this piece. Uh, and this sounds a little ridiculous, but, um, this particular, and this, this piece is in the show, there is a teeny tiny road, and there's a great detail of it in the catalog. It was the first Kansas-based landscape that had any, any real sign of humans in it. And it's about that long <laughs> in the drawing, and that was a huge deal for me to put that in the drawing. So call it the snowball effect, it's like, oh my goodness, now we have cities and architecture and uh, the title, this is actually based on a photograph taken from the third floor of McKnight West. Uh, it was a spectacular, pretty amazing sunset. Not this geometric, but not too far from this. Um, when I, one of the joys actually of, of working at WSU has been that view. Uh, it's terrific, if you've never been up there, you gotta go third floor looking west. Uh, because of the dark framing around the windows, floor to ceiling windows, it's like a painting. Uh, and it is constantly changing. Robert knows that just last week or whatever, one of those rainy days, I just said, Robert, look at this sky. You know, and it's the window thing. 
Um, so based pretty closely, uh, the tidal maneuvers, uh, the grain elevators from that view, especially at night, very much at night, when I was uh, new to that experience, uh, first of all, the flat landscape seemed like water to me. And at night, the grain elevators seemed like ships maneuvering into port. Uh, so there's that reference, but also uh, elements I mentioned early, use of land, urban sprawl, uh, what happens to land in terms of planning and, and development. So we see we go from a completely dark landscape on the left over to uh, a dense city on the right. Okay, this wins the prize for the biggest painting I've ever done. So, it, and thank goodness it's in the show. Uh, I've done 264 pieces since I've been here. Uh, when Patricia proposed the show after I got over the shock, um, I put together I images of 99 of my favorites out of those 264. A shorter list of 50, knowing that was probably still too many for the show. But at that time, I told Patricia, any of these would be fine, except some have to be in the show if we're going to do a survey. And this was one of them. And except for two that we didn't get, uh, we, all the other ones that I had on my we must have them uh, were on the list. I think all I'll really say here, I think you can see the snowball effect. Uh, I think on the show card, and it's very true, I, I couldn't believe Ron Christ, former formalist, was painting moons, or a moon and stars, and a little farmhouse with a light in the window, and fires. It's like, this is nuts. Um, so uh, we have Bush Stadium again. That influence is still there. This too is based on photographs I took of Kansas skies pretty closely. Uh, the terrain in the uh, painting is based quite closely on a 360 degree pan shot that I took at Coronado Heights up near Lindsborg. Um, and thematically, uh, certainly in the catalog, this is very clear, but in the show, the first figure, talk about heart attack time, is right there. I had not initially planned on putting that figure in the painting. Uh, and Barbara still remembers the day I called and said, guess what I've done now. And, um, Night Fires 2, uh, ups the ante a bit more. Now we have a male figure and a female figure. Uh, this is a little partner painting, so I'm glad they're both in the show. Um, when I'm working with students or when we talk with colleagues, uh, sometimes the term is uh, filmic or thinking cinematically about compositions. Uh, so this little painting is essentially that same standing male figure that's at the bottom of uh, Night Fires but it's a different view of the landscape. So another kind of reference to simultaneity, what's going on and, and what we see in the right painting is in this painting, it's, we just don't see it. The female figure especially. Okay, John Stewart talks about things that are awkward. That wasn't as good as he can do it. <laughs> So if you're a John Stewart fan, you've heard him do it better. Um, okay, left, some kind of awkward pieces that occurred at this time. Uh, if you were here earlier, you saw, again, the polyptics. One of my graduate faculty, James McGarrell, does polyptics. Uh, I find them very interesting optically, but uh, I also think for, uh, for static art, for simultaneous art, meaning that, uh, as a painter, when the painting is finished, everything is there. Um, polyptics, in their own way, I think get sort of like time-based art in that we can move from panel to panel and move through time uh, because of my 
uh, evolving interest in more thematic work, not really telling stories. That's why I you know, really don't like the word narrative. I prefer thematic. Um, that the polyptic seemed to be a real possibility. Uh, you know, I had done some of the multiple panel. I'd just finished Night Fires and some of the, actually, the uh, large Kansas-based landscapes. Uh, uh, some of the polyptics done earlier were more for practicality. I had to fit them in the van. Um, but polyptics were, were a great interest to me. Uh, so on the upper left is, uh, it wins the prize for the longest title I've ever used. And down below, and you see, uh, I wish now I wouldn't have destroyed that top one, but you know, things happen. Uh, then a small litho, and a uh, piece called Readings. Then Italy happened. So um, 1989 uh, were three summers in a row we spent in Italy. Um, I remembered a 1968 trip that, um, well, I'll tell you a quick story. I started at a community college uh, uh, south of St. Louis where I grew up um, before transferring. Thought I wanted to be an architect, but then math. And this was before electronic slide rules and calculators and stuff. So it became art. Um, and the painting instructor um, mentioned that the, the college was sponsoring an art-related tour of Europe a month. And of course, they wanted to get tickets sold. But he sat down with me and said, so you're thinking more seriously about being a painter? And I said, yes and transferring to a good school, yes. Tell me the museums you've been to. And I went, okay, uh, St. Louis Art Museum. And there was a quick trip to Chicago, more for baseball than art, but still. Um, and uh, I said, can I count the Missouri History Museum? And he said, <laughs> and, and I said, that's it. And he said, that's it? And he said, and I said, yep. And he said, well, before you decide to do this the rest of your life, you need to see more of what it is we're talking about. And so that hit me pretty hard. Again, he wanted people to, <laughs> to fill the plane, but still, uh, it made sense to me. So now getting back to Italy, uh, on that trip, uh, way back then, 1968, Italy clicked with me. Um, the light, the architecture, the textures, the surface, the food's not bad. The, the people are generally terrific. Their sense of style and design is pretty amazing. Certainly it varies. Um, but also I remember vividly uh, going to Arezzo and seeing Piero della Francesca's Legend of the True Cross Cycle. And with what was happening in my work, uh, this was another big technical change. Um, I stopped priming the uh, canvases, so let me move to something that's in the show. Yeah, this piece called The Game. Um, I stopped priming them. Uh, I still sized the linen, uh, but I wanted the linen to show through in areas, varying degrees and depending on the painting. I wanted, uh, sounds like a hair salon, I wanted a dry look. And um, th at this point, our another more beloved former colleague, Mira Merriman, came into my studio. And, and if you've been at the show, you know that, that, that these surfaces are matte, starting with this work. Um, Miram just said, why did you stop using color? <laughs> I said, Mira, I'm using the same colors I always have. If I would put a gloss varnish on the game, it would pop. It would, but why do you want that? And I said, Mira, the, for what I want to do in the paintings, they can't be as pretty anymore. So I know that's kind of a flip way of saying it, uh, but up to this time, the color tended to be quite luscious and I thought pleasing to look at. 
Um, but the tone and temperament of these pieces, especially utilizing the figure, needed to ratchet down. Um, so the 68 trip was primarily a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage to see Piero again. So this is, uh, back up. So this is a little watercolor, uh, the, kind of the, the, the second version of this uh, is in the show. Uh, so I came back and did drawings like that. And the game, this is the first piece that uh, the game board appeared. So again, it, it's better really just to read the gallery guide that Patricia goes into the function, the kind of metaphor of the game and the stage in my work. Uh, second summer in Gubbio, uh, or in Italy rather, and this is the second version, um, right? Um, initially, when Barbara and I were in that piazza in Gubbio, it's during the midday time. I think in the South America it's called siesta, and maybe in Spain as well. In in Central Italy, they don't, they don't call it anything. It's just the mid mid part of the day. People go to work from eight to twelve. Things shut down. Everybody goes home from 12 to 4, and everybody goes back to work from 4 to 8. Um, but we were in this piazza in Gubbio, and, and there was only that child with the soccer ball. And I just thought it was so surreal and st very Fellini. Um, so in this version, I uh, added more figures. I came back and did this painting, but I was thinking of Gubbio. So this is this in-between time. Uh, where the influence of Italy was starting to have a real effect. Um, a couple more slightly awkward paintings in a way, uh, when they were stolen, I thought, well, I guess I can interpret this as they really liked them or they really hated them <laughs> and because it was in between, who knows. But, uh, but the piece on the bottom uh, was the first painting where I actually utilized imagery from Italy uh, rather than inventing it. A couple more slightly odd paintings. So this was a time of testing things out, you know, not quite sure what to do. Uh, the piece on the bottom actually, which I, I still really like it. I did it as a reaction to the, in, the invasion of Kuwait. Um, you know, I mean, we, in our life events, sometimes something flips our switch. And that was just a historical event, uh, seeing those oil wells and, I mean, just the destruction. Um, so I, the idea of this piece is that the, this kind of rotating thing is like a targeting device on a fighter jet or a bomber. So it's a little protest piece. Um, then one of, the, one of the early, we don't have the first uh, fully Italian-based paintings in the show, but this is certainly an early one. And the previous image, uh, that's a really teeny little watercolor I did in, in the, s the summer just before. So came back, and this is when um, the switch occurred. The Italian-based work is, is the longest run. It, it was the longest plateau period. Uh, got to be 10, 12 years that I was into it, and I thought, I I'm overdue. If I'm staying on schedule, uh, but uh, a painter I admire greatly, William Bailey, one time he was challenged. Um, essentially the student, this was back in the hippie days when tough questions were asked, and the student just said, don't you get tired of painting the same thing? Because he was doing still lives. And he very calmly just said, as long as every painting offers something new, no. Um, so it was debated a little bit more, but you know, what are you gonna do? Tell him he's lying? Uh, so that was an important thing to hear too. So, uh, you know, it's something I've tried to keep in mind that, that as long as uh, during this long period of working with the Italian-based work, oh, I have to tell you why that's there. Um, you know, as long as each piece offered something new, uh, but then that too ran out. Um, the exhibition uh, label mentions that this is a painting I really like upside down. 
So obviously we can't hang it that way in the museum. So I just wanted to show it to you upside down. Um, where the, the kind of wackiness of the composition, uh, the kind of two-dimensional um, elliptical quality here, whichever way you want to read it, and then this convex kind of space created a, a fictional, an illusionistic curve. Um, but also to do this, uh, that um, the, the, the way I f judge whether uh, any piece is finished uh, is that I look at it upside down and in a mirror. So it's upside down and backwards. And with the representational work, uh, we lose that context. So we, it lets us see the abstraction of the painting more easily. Um, a couple in the show. If you visit the exhibition, uh, the two and a half hour long conversation I had with Patricia is where the little information on the label cards came from. So I'm not gonna blab too much about it here, you know, because it sums up really a kind of full-fledged tribute to the still life, this kind of uh, non-specific game board um, that's not referencing any game in particular. It's really the, the game as a metaphor and I'm not saying life is a game, but the reason I find it a great metaphor, if we think of the qualities involved in gaming, uh, luck, chance, fate, failure, victory, um, lots of life things uh, can parallel uh, the experience of the game. So the game board and the stage, you know, I think if anybody here is a theater major or theater lover, um, the stage, is a place where just about anything can happen. Fictional, of course. There are real, real people up there, but fictions are told. Uh, this is one of my favorite paintings I ever did. Barbara last night said we should have never gotten rid of that one, but it's called A Number of Basic Illusions. Um, in the Italian-based work, this, it, this is very much like the earliest still lives. The, this is a painting about painting, uh, dealing with fact and fiction and illusion. Uh, lots of linen showing in it. All of this is raw, well, not raw linen, sized linen. And then this little teeny sphere. Kind of a partner landscape to the one that's in the exhibition. When I leave a lot of linen show like this, uh, you know, art appreciators or certainly artists will know this. It's really the same thing you do in a drawing when you let the white of the paper show, where white of paper becomes something if it's representational, even if it's abstract. It can be a plane or part of a geometric shape. Uh, so those of you that know me well at all, it's my fact fiction thing. Um, the fact is that paintings are flat planes with, for the kind of work I'm doing, right angles, and you use paint. That's the fact, Jack. That's what they are. Uh, there, there is no landscape. There is no emotion. There, there is no feeling. You know, it's so fact and fiction. Um, and as we know in good literature or film, uh, fictional characters, fictions can become very believable and very real, but they have to be well done. They have to be believable. Uh, so I like that balance, kind of the contradiction that's going on between fact and fiction. Uh, we only have two watercolors in the show, so I, I tried to put a few more uh, in the talk. Uh, so a couple little watercolors there that then translated into paintings, the Pienza well. Uh, this is another one that uh, really wanted to have in the show, but didn't get this mirror from Antone. Um, some people read the figure as dead, but no, it's not. It's, uh, you know, it relates really to uh, uh, the dreamer, th these kind of other dreaming or meditating, pondering, thinking kind of figures. Um, this is the only Italian-based painting uh, where it was just female figures in it. 
So anyway, I was disappointed not to get it. Uh, many times the drawings and watercolors were paired up like this, um, and frequently it's a test, testing out um, the settings for uh, paintings, and one of them that's in the show comes up in just a bit. The one on the right is another one we couldn't get at the last minute. In the architectural, uh, architecture only Italian based paintings, and I think the exhibition card mentions this, th this, this is where my attention gets turned completely to the abstraction of the painting. They're of things because of the representational mode, but if the one on the right were turned upside down, I think you would see what I mean. Um, that it's a very abstract painting. Um, because the thematic content drops out, uh, the figurative images that carry a lot of weight and a lot of gravity drop out. So the focus can be uh, turned to the purely pictorial, mainly geometric. Uh, I made this one a little bigger. Uh, it's my, my joke, uh, my fact fiction joke. Uh, we have an architectural setting here. Um, the only, it's an oil painting on linen, the only place that has the linen showing on this painting is right there, that little square. And it's a piece of laundry hanging on a laundry line. So it could be linen. So it's just kind of a little, I forgot which composer Walter wrote musical joke. Who? Mozart. Mozart. So this is my, it's a painting joke. Uh, gotta have a little fun. So here we're getting into, uh, you know, some of the later Italian-based work. The painted version where I used the Montone Piazza again. Uh, still really thinking of one of those images of Bush Stadium, the one where the shadow was at the bottom, and the uh, canopy at the top. So things like that still were in play. And these are the last two. Uh, Italian-based paintings. The one on the left's in the show. I still like them, but I felt things were running out here, and um, they weren't as new. Um, and I knew when I did these and showed them in the faculty show two exhibitions ago, I, I knew it was over, uh, that uh, these drawings and their, the abstraction of them um, was starting to become more important uh, than continuing with the thematic aspects of, of the Italian-based work and really the late Kansas landscapes as well. Um, so that was really kind of the, the signal that it was time to move on. Abstraction has always been lurking, uh, so in, in a funny way it wasn't that big a, of a shift. Um, these are abstractions, they're not pure abstractions, um, so we're running out of time, but the, um, it was really about where I was at aesthetically, is what the titles relate to. Uh, we have the homage piece, there are two homage pieces in the exhibition, one to Balthus, this to Saarinen. Uh, you know, I grew up watching that amazing piece of sculpture, it's also a monument, but it, it, first of all, I just couldn't believe that they built that, or that, that a Midwest city picked that for that competition. Um, so, uh, incomplete experimental vault is where I felt I was. Here we go. Uh, tenuous resistance is where I was. Should I resist it? Keep cranking out those Italian-based paintings, or go, go with the change? So the painting I finished two weeks before the show opened is, is in the show. Uh, that's the first painting. Um, we'll see how things go. Uh, I think it will last. My hunch is that it will last this time. Uh, so I'm ending with a, another 2010 piece, uh, self-portrait. Um, 
I think that's it for the talk.